Now, the meninges are the membranes that envelop the brain. They're very similar to those that we see in the spinal cord. They lie between the nervous tissue and the bone. They are called the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater, and they protect the brain and provide structural framework for all of the arteries and veins to travel through. The dura mater will fold inward and extend between parts of the brain. For example, between the longitudinal fissure, you can see here that the dura mater has extended down in there to form the falx cerebri. Then another infolding happens between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. That's called the tentorium cerebelli. And then it, there's another sheet that separates the right and left halves of the cerebellum, and that's called the falx cerebelli. When we dissect the brain in class, you'll have a chance to see how these membranes form the different extensions between the parts of the brain. The next layer down is the arachnoid matter. The space beneath it is called the subarachnoid space. This is the space between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater. The subdural space is going to separate the arachnoid mater from the dura mater above it. Pia mater is a very thin membrane that follows the contours of the brain. Very difficult to even separate it from the brain. It dips into each sulci, and it's really not visible without looking in a microscope. Now, as we've explored, the brain is simply a hollow tube. As it makes its folds, some ventricles are created. These are inner chambers inside the brain. There are four of them. Two of them are lateral ventricles that you can see here in either cerebral hemisphere. The next is the third ventricle. You can see the third ventricle right in the center here. It's connected to the two lateral ventricles by a tiny pore called the interventricular foramen. The third ventricle is really just a small, narrow space. It's just beneath the corpus callosum. This narrow space is connected to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. The fourth ventricle is a small triangular chamber that we can see right between the pons and the cerebellum. It connects to the central canal and runs down through the spinal cord. Inside each ventricle is a spongy mass of blood capillaries called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus gives rise to the cerebral spinal fluid that fills the ventricles. You'll remember some neuroglial cells called the ependymal cells. This lines each ventricle and covers the entire choroid plexus and are responsible for the production of the cerebral spinal fluid that goes into the ventricles and surround the spinal cord and brain. Here's a view of the lateral ventricles. You can also see the third ventricle right in the center here. So cerebral spinal fluid is a clear colorless liquid that fills the ventricles and the canals of the central nervous system, as well as bathing the external surface of the brain and spinal cord. The brain produces and reabsorbs about 500 milliliters of cerebral spinal fluid each day. About 100 to 160 milliliters are normally present at one time, bathing the surfaces of the brain. It's essentially like the blood of the brain. It's all the components that carry the nutrients necessary for the brain and carry waste away from the brain without carrying actual red blood cells and white blood cells and many of the proteins that are present in the blood. 40% of the cerebral spinal fluid is formed in the subarachnoid space, which is external to the brain, and 30% by the general ependymal lining of the brain ventricles, as well as 30% by the vessels of the choroid plexus, again covered in ependymal cells. Production begins with filtration of the blood plasma through the capillaries of the brain. The ependymal cells modify the filtrate so cerebral spinal fluid has more sodium and chloride than plasma, but less potassium, calcium, glucose, and it has very little protein content. This diagram shows us the production and flow of cerebral spinal fluid.
Cerebral spinal fluid could be secreted by the choroid plexus or general ependymal linings, and it will flow through the interventricular foramina into the third ventricle. In the third ventricle, the choroid plexus will add more cerebral spinal fluid, and the cerebral spinal fluid will flow down through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle located here beneath the cerebellum. The choroid plexus in the fourth ventricle adds yet more cerebral spinal fluid, and then the cerebral spinal fluid will flow out through two lateral apertures and one median aperture so that it can then fill the subarachnoid space and bathe the brain and spinal cord. At the arachnoid villi, cerebral spinal fluid is reabsorbed into the venous blood supply of the dural sinuses. Now, cerebral spinal fluid has a number of different functions. First of all, it allows buoyancy, allowing the brain to attain considerable size without being impaired by its own weight, so it allows it to float around in the cranium. If the brain rested heavily on the floor of the cranium, the pressure would kill all the nervous tissue and prevent signals from making their way around the brain. CSF also functions in protection. It forms a barrier around the brain so it doesn't strike the side of the cranium when the head is jolted. However, it is possible with a severe enough jolting for the brain to hit the cranium. This is often used as evidence in child abuse or shaken child syndrome and is certainly the cause of concussion. The third function would be chemical stability. The flow of cerebral spinal fluid rinses away the metabolic rates from the nervous tissue and homeostatically regulates the chemical environment surrounding the brain. Finally, we'll look at blood supply to the brain. The brain is only about 2% of the adult body weight, yet it receives about 15% of the blood. It gets about 750 milliliters each minute. The neurons in the brain have a high demand for ATP and therefore oxygen as well as glucose, so the constant supply of blood is critical. Even a 10 second interruption of blood flow can cause loss of consciousness. A one to two minute interruption can cause significant impairment of the neuron function and four minutes without blood can cause irreversible brain damage. So the blood supply is ultimately important. So the blood is also a source of antibodies as well as macrophages and bacterial toxins and other harmful agents. So it's important that we keep these agents away from the brain. The blood-brain barrier system strictly regulates what substances can get from the bloodstream into the tissue fluid of the brain. There are two points of entry that need to be guarded. First, the blood capillaries throughout the brain tissue, and then the capillaries of the choroid plexus. Now, the blood-brain barrier is not literally a barrier. I always had imagined that it was sort of no blood goes anywhere near the brain, but actually the capillaries are scattered throughout the brain tissue. The blood-brain barrier, however, wraps each of these capillaries throughout the brain tissue. It consists of tight junctions between the endothelial cells of the capillary walls as well as astrocytes, you might recall. They reach out to contact the capillaries with their perivascular feet, and this induces the endothelial cells to form the tight junctions and completely seal off the gaps between them. Thus, anything leaving the blood has to pass through the endothelial cells and not between them. That way, the endothelial cells can exclude the harmful substances from passing to the brain tissue while allowing the necessary ones to pass. The blood CSF barrier protects the brain at the choroid plexus. It forms tight junctions between the ependymal cells. The tight junctions are absent from ependymal cells elsewhere. It's important to allow exchange between the brain tissue and the cerebral spinal fluid. The blood barrier system is highly permeable to water, glucose, lipid-soluble substances such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, and anesthetics. It's slightly permeable to sodium, potassium, chloride, and the waste products urea and creatine. 
The blood-brain barrier system, however, does provide an obstacle for delivering some medications, such as antibiotics and cancer drugs. Sometimes trauma and inflammation can damage the blood-brain barrier system. This allows pathogens to enter brain tissue. Another way that pathogens may enter is through these circumventricular organs. They're small places in the third and fourth ventricle where the barrier is absent. It's necessary to have the barrier absent here because the blood needs to have direct access to the brain areas that detect fluctuations in blood glucose, pH, osmolarity, and other variables that need to be responded to. So circumventricular organs then can also allow a route for invasion by things like HIV and other pathogens. Take a moment here to consider again the two different blood barrier systems. We've got the blood cerebral sp spinal fluid barrier that is about forming tight junctions between the ependymal cells lining the ventricles of the brain. And then the blood-brain barrier system protecting the capillaries throughout the brain tissue. Draw a quick diagram of each of those.